so I'll, I'll be very brief so that we can listen to uh, Vint and not me. Um, so I thought I would welcome everybody to uh, today's, it's actually the 16th interactive video Q&A session. This is Vint's second. And my name is Ben Baldwin, for those who don't know me. And I'm hosting this series or helping to host it with David and Vint. And I started this series because I think we should be sharing and helping each other. And uh, this is not my day job. As a quick intro, I'm co-founder of a company named Scale Driver, and we help executives who need to build innovation, not just buy it. And what we do is we help to de-risk the growth of innovation through um, working with innovators and founders and sharing factual experiences, which is why I really like this format here, <clears throat> because we get to hear from, from both Fint and from the audience around sharing real firsthand experiences um, around innovation and um, you know pushing the limits on the future of work in particular and the people-centered economy. Um, so I think we can apply some of the same principles here and I like live video in particular as a format because it's a great way to introduce ourselves and, and interact in an informal and synchronous way and we can even ask for help. So um, David, are you on here? Do you want to do a quick intro of uh, the initiative, if you can get your sound on? Yes, yes. And then we'll flip it right Thank to Thank you, Ben. And, and I'm happy to see so many people here today. I think this is close to a record. Uh, so Ben started this series actually, uh, I think two years ago, something like that. And uh, now we decided to revive it because the community has become so wonderfully active uh, so the, I think the idea here is, uh, along with Ben's, uh, why Ben likes this format, it's that this is for Vint, but it's also for everyone else to get to chat a bit. And uh, if you like the chat here, you can go on chatting in a discussion group online and the other way around. Um, so. Thank you, Ben. Um, is there anything I forgot to say? I don't think I have so. ADD, you see. So <laughs> they were all well, good. Actually, there, it's good. Been, thank there you. is there thank is something you. that there is something David didn't uh, say, and that is that the uh, Innovation for Jobs organization cares a great deal about matching people up with jobs, and so uh, part of the reason for this particular conversation is the process by which that matching takes place yes. or mapping takes place. And uh, some of the issues that we can anticipate uh, might uh, that might arise as we try to do a better and better job of that uh, mapping of work uh, to skill. Uh, and among the things that are at issue here are people's privacy. So uh, we care a great deal about that at I4J as well. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Ben. Yes, so, uh, so Ben, just to add here, because I'm thinking now that maybe a few people here uh, aren't fully acquainted with I4J, that I4J right. stands for Innovation for Jobs. And it started uh, back in 2011. Uh, Vint and I and Sven Litterin, who was the Swedish Minister for Employment, uh, we thought that uh, innovation can create jobs and not only destroy jobs. So we started very early to talk about how to innovate for jobs and how to innovate good jobs for people instead of innovating them away. And uh, here we are today. And I think that we, we have actually a good picture of how this is going to happen. And this is, uh, you can read more about in our forthcoming book, The People-Centered Economy, uh, where we imagine an ecosystem for jobs, where several of you who are here today are part of that ecosystem, innovating great jobs to fit people. That's it. Great. So what I'll do now is flip it over to Vint and let Vint um, take it from here. Okay. Well, I have Thanks, a very, uh, thank you very much, Ben and uh, Dave, and I uh, thank all of the rest of you for joining us uh, in this uh, little conversation. I have the chat bar up here in case anybody chooses to type it, at it. I'll try to pay attention to that. Um, my primary concern in this uh, discussion has to do with the um, obvious, I think, fact that the more information that is available about you and your skills, uh, the more likely it is that uh, we can figure out how to fit a job to uh, your, your unique capabilities. 
the implication of that, of course, is that that's a lot of personal information potentially that uh, that needs to be in hand in order to uh, to do this uh, computation, if you like. And it's been my view that it's very important that people who uh, share this information uh, uh, with uh, this matching process feel uh, and know and are, uh, let us say, uh, comfortable that their personal information will only go to the parties that they authorize it to go to and that they have some control over with what information reaches those parties. Uh, this is uh, potentially extra work in some sense because a system that's designed to achieve that objective might have to interrupt you uh, or draw your attention to a request for certain information. You'd have to decide whether you want to release it or not. <clears throat> for some people who uh, are less concerned about this, you, I'm sure that the system could be configured to be quite open and release whatever information is requested. Uh, on the other hand, uh, even in that case, there might be some details that you would prefer uh, to retain a, a precise control over. The implication of, of that uh, is that uh, the content that you want to control might well be encrypted. Uh, and of course, there's always a risk factor here because as soon as you start encrypting things, once you lose the keys and you can't decrypt them, uh, it's, it's very hard to recover from uh, from that situation. So hanging on to keys turns out to be very important. At the same time, uh, the idea that you could encrypt content and only authorize uh, access by sending a, a decryption key to a party that has requested that information gives you more precise control. It also uh, could give you an auditable record of who has what information. Uh, you can even imagine if you wanted to be paranoid about this, that, uh, you could alter the information in such a way that you could tell to whom you had given it in case it shows up in places where it didn't belong and you become aware of that. You might have some sense for either who deliberately released it or whose system was penetrated uh, to release that information. That's probably several sigma out on the paranoid chain. But the idea that uh, that the whole system be designed around individual control over content uh, about you that you want to manage uh, and giving you cryptographic authority over that uh, data uh, seems to me technically very attractive. Uh, in practice, uh, because uh, you're worried about managing keys and knowing which ones that you ha are need in order to um, give access to content, uh, might make this uh, so annoying that nobody wants to do it. And I'm fully conscious of the uh, potential hazard. This, by the way, is not very different than a lot of other systems where your permission is requested for various actions to be taken. And at some point, if too many interventions occur, you start to become annoyed and you say, to hell with it, I don't use the service anymore, or just let everything go, or something else. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think we would be wise uh, as I think about um, the possibility of a system being developed out of the I4J initiative, uh, which is uh, consuming uh, personal information in an effort to uh, help job creators uh, create jobs that match the skills that they're looking for, uh, that we should at least show uh, sensitivity uh, to this concern and to design into it the capability to give very fine-grained authority uh, to the users whose information is needed in order to accomplish the objective. So that's sort of the very uh, high-level summary of uh, why I'm concerned about this. Uh, it shows up, that concern shows up in textual form uh, in the new book that uh, David mentioned, The People-Centered Economy. Uh, I thought for a moment uh, to uh, take a little side channel here that the two books that uh, have been produced have two titles which in a way uh, illustrate uh, how far I4J has evolved from its 2011 origins. And actually I am astonished, uh, David, that it's eight, seven years. I mean, this is, where did those seven years go? I mean, poof. Uh, the first book was called Disrupting Unemployment. This is a, a brilliant uh, cognitive dissonance that David uh, invented uh, because you have to think very hard about what the hell does that actually mean? Uh, and uh, my interpretation was always that uh, the, the people who are at present unemployed 
should be viewed not as a burden, but a resource. And that's how I read that title, which is that let us use the people who are not employed now as a resource to find employment for them, uh, productive employment for them. Uh, and we noticed over this course of the seven years or so that there was a very um, increasing recognition uh, of the people-centric nature of what I4J talked about. Uh, the awareness of the importance of work and, and the dignity of work, to say nothing of the income generation of work. Uh, we even reached the uh, realization that not all work necessarily needs to be compensated, uh, that what people are looking for uh, in the event that they don't need more compensation, uh, compensation is work which they uh, feel is productive, that is contributing to the society and makes them feel as if they are uh, you know, positive, uh, constructive members of that society. And so meaningful work uh, is important regardless of its uh, remuneration. But to come back now to uh, this whole notion of mapping skills into, um, into uh, work, uh, David and others uh, in I4J have also uh, certainly persuaded me that um, the idea of uh, re recasting this process uh, into um, the construction of work to match skills uh, is a, a path towards enormous job satisfaction and also significant engagement. Now that term, engagement, is often used in the language we hear from another company that participates in R4J, and that's Gallup. Uh, Gallup has a, a practice uh, uh, a um, um, method of testing people's uh, skill sets uh, that they call strength finder. And these are, the point, uh, I should say, these are strengths, not skills. Uh, so they uh, have a fairly elaborate questionnaire, which anyone can choose to take uh, for a small fee. And it will analyze some 35 different characteristics uh, of strengths that people have and then rank order them according to your answers. Uh, recently, uh, they have been pursuing another kind of questionnaire uh, that's intended to discover entrepreneurial strength. Because not everyone has the kind of personal characteristics that lead to successful entrepreneurship. Uh, the, Jim Clifton, the CEO of Gallup, feels very strongly about this and offers statistics that are on the order of one out of 15,000 people have the uh, capacity to start uh, successful businesses. Uh, and in fact, it's also fair to say that not every person who starts a business is going to be successful. That's yet another metric to be concerned about. But they now trying to discover uh, who the entrepreneurs are. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be an entrepreneur to take advantage of the idea of, 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 a, uh, of a job mapped into your skill or your skills mapped into a job. Uh, but uh, the creation of new businesses that take advantage of that concept uh, seems to me one theme that we've been hearing over, over and over again in the I4J discussions. So at this stage of the game, uh, we don't actually have a working example of a uh, job generation uh, system. Uh, we've invented a term for it. David, again, uh, gets credit for his uh, ability to create interesting words. In this case, it was a company he called Jobly as an application. And uh, as I contemplated the uh, development, design, and implementation of Jobly, this is, I was drawn to this question of protecting people's privacy and giving them control over information. But what, uh, what uh, Jobly uh, was uh, conceptually intended to do, again, putting words in David's mouth, uh, is uh, to absorb people's uh, skills and history and capabilities and then uh, invent uh, the kind of uh, work uh, that would fit uh, better uh, that skill set. Uh, it's also been um, uh, an important theme showing up in the people-centered economy that uh, we should we should be looking for not so much for how to make tasks more efficient which is a uh, consistent uh, focus of attention in a lot of companies. 
uh, we will make ourselves more profitable if we make this particular work more efficient, which eventually turns into you know automation in many cases. Uh, what uh, David correctly points out and what uh, many other people uh, in I4J have observed is that uh, what we really want to do is make people more valuable uh, to, to uh, bring to um, their uh, activities increased uh, res and resulting increasing value of their work as opposed to reducing the cost of a task. And so this is not a task centric kind of thing. Uh, David, maybe uh, it's worth asking you uh, whether, uh, whether or not um, you think that the, the jobly mechanism that, that you conceptualized uh, and the, uh, this notion of making people more valuable uh, somehow go together. And one, one question is, how do they fit together? And maybe you could say a little bit about how you view that. Right. So, um, thanks, Vin. Um, so, so, yeah, if you think about, you know, all the resources, all the abilities that a person has, including the ones that we don't know that we have, and then we think about a mechanism for measuring that, for profiling that, and that could be something like uh, the Strengths Finder that you talk about, that Gallup has. So think about the Strengths Finder on steroids that, that really, you know, can help you find out who you are and what you would be able to do, maybe to an extent that is so vast that it couldn't even tell it to you. So you, you have this, so Jobly measures that, um, and, and then it kind of finds somebody who needs things done, and maybe they don't know that they need some things done where you can be really useful in a way that you don't know and then it creates the match so it kind of finds out what you can do and then it goes to um the guy who who kind of is like the employer shall we say or, or the guy you sell the work to and says have you thought about this that you might need a person who can do this and in the job, the example that, that uh, Vint and I published together, uh, so he's giving me far too much credit here, but um, well, it was, um, in this case, a person who actually existed in reality, uh, uh, a lady in Paris who was my Airbnb hostess. Uh, she, she was educated as a development economist for working in countries like Brazil uh, and so on, helping their con develop. But she actually wanted to become an aura healer and she was a musician. And it turned out that she saw colors when she heard music and she saw color around people like auras. And if one does research on that, there is a condition called synesthesia, which one thinks is behind seeing auras. These people actually see colors. And it turns out that these people can be very sensitive uh, to seeing people. Um, and that's also in the nature of what an aura healer does. Kind of, it's like an extra perception. Maybe, you know, it's like it smells who people are, like dogs or something. Uh, so, David, David uh, I, I apologize yes. for interrupting the flow. I'm I realize that we have about eight minutes left, if I am correct. Is that? Is oh, that right? sorry. Yeah. So let me just round off. Oh, no, wait. No, no. I'm. I'm sorry. No, we have we have oh, half an hour. You're good. Missed, yeah. Missed, so we, I, I, uh, I have eight. I have several questions that I want to answer. But David, please complete your thought. I just was miscounting. The yeah, time. yeah. So, so, for for once, I was not the confused one. Thanks, Vin. So, otherwise, I, I usually am. You see, but by the way, so so. Uh, we, so Jobly invents a job for her with USAID because corruption is the big problem in developmental work. And once you have a corrupt team, receiving team in a developing country, you get into the situation where aid becomes poor people in rich countries giving money to rich people in poor countries, and you can never get out of that. So a girl like her could become extremely valuable in sniffing out who are the honest people wow. in countries like Brazil. And she would use her 
uh, degree and uh, her, her uh, what do you say, her, uh, uh, her skill, uh, education and yep. uh, her skill in developmental economy. Plus, she knew pure Portuguese and had lived in Brazil. So she would be perfect for finding that initial team that will not start, uh, you know, uh, embezzling the money. And that is like a requirement that could solve huge problems in, in, in aid work. So that was the example. And, you know, we invented a job for aura healers where they actually can earn a good living. That's what Jobly did. Now, back to Vint, to send it back to him, you can imagine the amount of privacy that Jobly did do when it comes to this girl and so when it comes to the recipient, right, the USAID. And, and that, that, of course, you know, it knows everything about her, more than she knows about herself. So how do we protect that? And uh, here, I think also, Vint, I should send to you the word uh, blockchain, because everybody thinks, many people think that blockchain is going to solve this, but I know that you don't think so. So sending back to you, what kind of private mechanism should Jobly have in order for this Orahila to, to trust to use this thing? Right. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, there are a set of questions here. I'm going to address them uh, in the order in which they arrive. Blockchain does show up in several of them, so we'll get to that. Uh, the first point that is made uh, by uh, Mark uh, Prensky uh, is that uh, there's information that you, that you know and share deliberately about yourself, uh, when he refers to this as your data. Uh, and then there, is, um, uh, then there is data about you, uh, which may be known by other people, may have been generated by uh, your interactions with the rest of the world, with other systems in the world. Uh, and if you frequently have no control over how that information is protected or whether or not it's released. In fact, this is one of the big problems we have today with our online environment. Uh, so I have to confess that the information that you choose to contribute to the system, I think I can see how one could give you fairly strong control over, but it may not give you any control over information that other people have about you who are, that you don't have a direct ability to be, uh, release uh, because, uh, or, or to inhibit release because in fact it's not under your control. Uh, and so we do have a, a serious problem um, outside of that which we have contributed and can control in the jobly sense, for instance, uh, and that's other information. And there, all you have available, I think, is legislation that says the following kinds of information must be protected, and if it is not protected, then your rights have been violated. The GDPR coming out of Europe is an, an attempt to achieve an objective along those lines. Um, with regard to blockchain, I am not persuaded that blockchain is uh, the, the means by which this uh, uh, mechanism it can be implemented uh, for two reasons. The first one, of course, is that the public blockchain uh, is intended to preserve integrity. Once the information gets into the system, it's hard to change because it's been digitally signed. However, it doesn't guarantee that it's been uh, protected in the sense of um, inhibiting access. In fact, you have to uh, not only digitally sign, but you would have to additionally encrypt the information and then someone would have to get permission from you uh, to uh, decrypt the information. Um, and uh, in fact, the more I think about the way that would work, the more difficult I think it would be because then you would be peppered um, by requests to uh, take the information and if you still wanted to protect it to make sure it only gets to the right party, uh, you might very well need to decrypt it yourself and then send it to the other party uh, with a key only, uh, only they can decrypt. Um, and, and this is not a good place to be getting deep into implementation, but blockchain does not guarantee much. The second thing that I worry about with regard to uh, uh, to blockchain uh, is that there is no guarantee that the information that gets into the blockchain is accurate. It may be that after it gets in there you can uh, inhibit its modification, but uh, there's also a problem that uh, if it gets in because somebody deliberately injected false information, then all you've done is protect the integrity of the false information. 
I'm not saying, however, that blockchain would be useless. I'm simply saying that it's not clear you need that particular mechanism to solve the problem. A distributed database um, with digitally signed and encrypted content might be just as effective uh, at doing this. But I'm not trying to poo-poo uh, the use of blockchain for this particular application. Now, there was a, another question um, which specifically um, uh, asking about Estonia, and uh, indeed it's correct. The health information, as I understand it in the Estonian system, is um, most strongly uh, oriented towards integrity of the information. Uh, the, Tumas Ilvis, the former president of Estonia, uh, said repeatedly he was more concerned about integrity than he was about privacy. He didn't want someone to change his health record, to change his blood type, because he was concerned that if he needed a transfusion and someone changed the blood type, that, uh, that uh, he might die because of the wrong kind of blood being used. Uh, I don't think he said, therefore, he didn't care about the privacy of the health information, but he said that in terms of rank ordering, its uh, integrity was more important to him than the privacy. Um, but there is, in fact, um, uh, a good reason to turn to Estonia um, to see what they've done and how well it's worked. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are only about a million and a half people in Estonia. Uh, and the reason that number is important is that um, because it's relatively small compared to many other countries, uh, you can do this and require this uh, particular mechanism of everyone in the country. You can issue keys uh, and identification uh, and authentication capacity to literally every single person in the country. Uh, once you can be assured that 100% of the population is part of the system, uh, you can do things that would be much harder to do if a, only a subset of the population uh, was uh, sort of registered in the system. And so they are an important example to follow because it tells you what's the in many cases, the best you could do given 100% participation. Uh, so I'm, I'm a fan of paying attention to what has worked in Estonia. Uh, and I think one of the things that has worked is that everyone, uh, it was possible to put everyone into the system. Um, let's see, uh, the, uh, there's another uh, question uh, that comes up and that's Mark Andreessen's investment in blockchain. Uh, the fact that a lot of people are investing in blockchain does not necessarily make it a uh, perfect solution to a number of problems that uh, we are encountering. Uh, but it does increase the probability that implementations of blockchain will, uh, at least some of them, uh, will be successful. Uh, and we will have to see uh, how this all comes out. I'm reminded that during the dot boom period from 2000 to 1995 to 2000, uh, we saw literally billions of dollars in capital going into many different companies, uh, some of which did not have a real business model. Uh, and, uh, and eventually they failed when they ran out of capital in April of 2000. Uh, so we should be careful not to associate everyone is investing in it uh, uh, with everyone will be successful. Uh, the next comment, uh, sorry, I haven't been mentioning names, but anyone who's looking at, at the uh, chat bar can see who, who posed these questions. So the next one uh, says, um, this, this type of human-centered framework would reduce the stigma and minimize the heavy focus and diagnosis on disability. Uh, I think, I, we hope that's right. And as uh, David implied in his comments, the notion of cool ability, which are abilities that might be associated with what is otherwise called disability, but which gives someone a capability that is unusual and uh, potentially applicable, um, like you know, people working in noisy environments and things like that, uh, or autistic people uh, feeling uh, a, are capable of doing programming work better than many others are. These sorts of strengths uh, can in fact be um, applied, used to figure out how to tailor jobs and job working conditions in order to improve productivity. Uh, and that I think, I hope you're right. Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, we stop worrying about people's disabilities and pay much more attention to what they can do and how to make them successful. And so I agree with the general assessment that this would reduce, should reduce 
uh, or it has the potential to reduce this whole uh, excessive fo focus on disability. Uh, the next thing uh, is, is I, I think I have to read this carefully, it's from Robert Pye. Have you considered that a potential solution to the privacy problem is to aggregate the supply demand use case, use cases into non-personal and generic cohorts that will link to individuals and, uh, and new jobs behind the brokers, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the answer is yes, I have, I think, you know, depending on what Robert meant. So I will give an answer based on what I think Robert might have meant, and then Robert can tell me, no, that wasn't what he intended. Um, if you imagine for a moment that you want to tailor uh, a piece of a work, piece of work for someone with specific capabilities, uh, then you have a, s a set of work that needs to get done. And you can imagine partitioning that work into a variety of different uh, buckets, so to speak. Uh, in the formal management uh, terminology, this is sometimes called a work breakdown structure, which shows you what is the task in a hierarchical distribution of work into uh, different components. Uh, in order to make this idea, this jobly idea and this mapping idea work, you need to be prepared to recast the work breakdown structure based on the skill sets that you have at your disposal. And one of the important questions that uh, you end up with, of course, is that as you start to cover the work with people whose skills match certain needs, uh, then you end up like a picture puzzle with some holes where pieces go and you have to be able to figure out whether you can find someone who fits that piece. So I think the answer is very interestingly a possibility that we, um, we somehow develop algorithms that take the skill collections that we've discovered in the people who are in the system and the work that needs to be done and consider a variety of different mappings uh, in, in the geometric, mathematical geometric sense, it's called a covering of the of the space so that every every need is covered by someone whose skills match that requirement uh, it's a very interesting and it's also not a um, uh, what's the right word for this it may not be algorithmic uh, in the um, in the uh, deterministic sense this may have to be a non-deterministic algorithm for achieving this covering uh, so let's, uh, we'll find out whether uh, whether or not I got anywhere close to what Robert was uh, thinking of. Uh, we have the mention of uh, Charlie Grundwag's um, uh, neologism cool abilities, I, which I, I guess I attributed to David, but I guess Charlie gets the credit for that. Next question is, uh, how do we balance efforts to construct work to match skills with efforts to help people improve their skills? Well, I think that it isn't even a question of balance. I think this is a, a requirement. So the point is extremely well made. If we think about lifetimes that extend to 100 years or more, um, and which is now quite uh, readily anticipated, we know that people will have working lives of 70 to 80 years. And during that period of time, technology will change the nature of work. I mean, this is, this is clear from history. Uh, the consequence of that is that learning new skills is going to be essential. And so this mapping process uh, will fail at some point for people who haven't learned anything new because their skills may not map into anything useful 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now. Uh, for some people that may not be the case, maybe they're generalists who, with a high adaptability uh, capability, but for some people new skills are going to be essential for um, satisfying and remunerative work. Um, let's see, uh, John Shell uh, comes back uh, with regard to Estonia uh, and says, is there is theirs the right tech for the particular problem? If you're correct that we wouldn't require 100% participation. Um, and, so, uh, and so I agree with that. I think the only reason that, uh, that I was uh, picking on Estonia is that uh, sometimes you get a sense for the maximum possibilities if everyone is participant in the system. If only 10% of the population participates uh, in the country, let's say, 
then that 10% may actually have an advantage over the others who didn't participate. Um, of course, that might be an incentive for people to become part of the system because they see the advantage other people are, are gaining. Um, so I, I accept the point, however, that not everybody has to participate in this for it to be useful. Um, that's interesting. And John comes back and says uh, he doesn't want to belabor Estonia, but he is beating this theme pretty hard. Uh, it's always interested when, or interesting when someone solves a really big problem. I agree with that. Okay, let's go to Tricia. Um, she's, oh my God, she's calling in from Lima, Peru. Buenos dias, Tricia. Como esta? Um, Let's see, what examples have you and David seen in terms of how apps and solutions are able to increase the value of people's skills at scale, especially the rural to urban migration? We're seeing people in Peru uh, from rural communities going into urban areas en masse, but it's very unskilled labor, and they're taking work that puts them in vulnerable positions. Absolutely correct. The same problem is showing up in China as a great push is taking place in the West to move people from the rural parts of the community to new urban cities. And I think the answer to this is that um, absorbing people into urban environments uh, almost certainly uh, should be matched with training programs uh, that increase people's skill level and broaden the uh, jobs for which they might be uh, suitable. Uh, I think in the absence of that, uh, you run into a serious social problem because as you point out those uh, unskilled laborers are very vulnerable because uh, the competition may be very high for low paid positions. Um, next question is uh, assessment of strengths begin in school matching kids with potential internships and mentors. Uh, I, so I, th I think the answer is yes. Um, however, we have to also assume that the strengths that people show are often learned uh, capabilities as opposed to uh, purely inherent talent. Uh, <clears throat> so we should not allow uh, the uh, early um, results of these kinds of tests uh, to uh, severely uh, impact the future possibilities that these young people have. In some cultures, um, I will pick on Japan and China in particular, uh, it is the case that uh, depending on what school you get into, your entire future life uh, is, uh, is very much constrained or enhanced. Uh, and so the, the tension level, personal stress levels go way up uh, at very early stages in people's lifetimes when they find themselves competing for a limited number of seats at the best or most uh, effective schools or the most prestigious schools. Uh, so I want to be very cautious about the use of these tools. On the other hand, I think that um, David and I have occasionally thought that child labor may actually be a good thing in the following sense. Uh, early exposure to uh, remunerative work uh, it may actually be very beneficial. Uh, plainly, we have to avoid abuse and all the other things that one would be regularly concerned about. Uh, but the notion of introducing uh, this idea of discovering, um, uh, let us say, uh, constructive and productive work at, at, the, at an earlier age, I think is a very, very uh, sensible kind of thing. I mean, I think I learned a lot uh, when I was 14 years old. Um, I was uh, refilling automatic coffee making machines. Um, it was actually a horrible job because by the time I got the machine for re, you know, refurbishing, uh, the eight cylinders of coffee were covered in yellow mold because the thing went, you know, like this, uh, like a uh, reciprocating engine on a, uh, on a propeller aircraft. Uh, they would use different urns, eight of them, one after the other. So after a month or whatever the time was, two weeks, uh, they would used up all the coffee. But the time I got to, it was all covered with this horrible yellow mold. I had to clean all that stuff up and then put fresh coffee in. But I learned uh, a very important thing uh, about that. First of all, it was great to get paid for work. And the second thing was that I never wanted to do that again uh, in my career. Um, so I think the general answer uh, to Mark's question is yes, I think early uh, evaluations are important as long as they are not so rigid that they inhibit uh, future possibilities for, uh, for everyone. I see Tricia and Mui Bien. I'm glad to hear that. 
Uh, Melissa, uh, maybe you could say more about happens in Jamaica, uh, because I'm not sure which thing you're saying it, ha it happens, unless you're referring to this rigi rigidity thing. I was referring to the um, competition for getting into the good school because you're limited by the school that you get into. Got it. Uh, you know, uh, just to reinforce your concern uh, and to uh, draw attention to another one, uh, there is such a thing as over-demanding uh, education. And at Google, for quite a long time, uh, we tended to insist that everybody have a four-year degree if they're going to come to work at Google. We have, I believe, relinquished uh, that uh, requirement recognizing that there are people coming out of high school, some of whom we've trained with our, our Google for Work program, uh, that make them uh, quite eminently productive employees. And so this uh, unnecessary focus on uh, over-education in the early stages of someone's life uh, may in fact be harmful. And so uh, I really take your point. Uh, let's see what Thomas has to say. He says schools are absolutely critical gatekeepers to data. And I think this is more prevalent for those who may be already silenced from the process, such as individualized education plan meetings that discuss their personal, personal data um, from a, a, I don't understand what a deflict-based framework. Thomas, if you're online, uh, maybe you can uh, explain just a little bit more about what you were getting at here. I'm familiar with IEPs, um, and I, I gather your, the implication of what you're saying is you're concerned that these should, should, the privacy of the IEP should be protected. But uh, if you're still on, maybe you can type a little more to uh, get to the core of, of the issue that you want to uh, address. Uh, let's see, David's already responded to Tricia. Uh, no apps are helping um, these people. By the way, I, I want to make a meta observation about something. Uh, I'm sitting here doing all the talking. Uh, some of you are, um, are trying to add questions and comments. The last time I did this, we discovered that I should shut up and everybody, and everybody should type. And the reason is that instead of having to go one person at a time, which the oral method requires, we can all type at the same time. And so this was an experiment now. Yeah, it's the so only time everybody's ever been so orderly, but uh, if you're open to opening it up, that would oh, be great. I'm, I'm absolutely this. happy to have <laughs> questions, but, but the point I wanna make is that this is more efficient because people can talk, so to speak, they can type while I am talking. And in fact, uh, it, this is more effective than stopping and forcing everyone to uh, wait until they get called on. Here they can just inject the comment at, at any time. So let's see what else. Uh, maybe Thomas will come back and it, here it is. He says, IEPs are often meetings by professionals who are so-called experts. Uh, oh, uh, yes, I absolutely understand that. Uh, and, uh, and I do worry greatly about the process of developing IEPs. On the other hand, I have seen spectacular and amazingly successful results with some IEPs where a teacher knew and understood that a particular student was capable of doing things that no one else thought he could do. And I watched young, young, one young man grow up from, you know, like age five to now age 16. Uh, becoming extremely good. He was language delayed. He was a behavioral problem, everything else. This kid is now getting straight A's in high school. He's on his way to college. He's interested in science and technology. I would have lost money on this kid if I had bet that he was incapable of doing those things, but his teacher knew better. And so she devised an IEP for him. So there are, are good stories, and I'm sure there are some bad ones as well. Um, let's, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, it's, it's Jim Clifton, by the way, not Clifford, uh, for John uh, Madison's comment. Um, I, yes, I love the, I love the point you're making here that uh, developing strength-based enhancement key gap analysis for mitigating adjacency. Uh, in fact, um, I think that, that what Jim is trying to do is to simultaneously help employers 
find uh, how to match people's skills to work and also create new businesses by finding entrepreneurs and encouraging them to create new business, which creates new work. And so this is a one-two punch that, uh, that Jim is uh, pursuing uh, and extraordinarily effectively. We'll see more. He's made some personal bets on people that showed entrepreneurial capacity by funding them uh, to start their businesses. So he's putting his money where his mouth is as well. Uh, Trisha, it looks to me like, uh, David, you and Trisha need to get together, and I see you've already figured that out. Uh, Robert, uh, back to Robert, he says, one of the things that we found in terms of aggregation of cohorts was that we can push out open data on the supply and demand needs, creating an ecosystem that is open by default. Uh, so, uh, Robert, let me try something on you. Let us imagine we have a body of work that we want to get done. Uh, and we, if we create a work breakdown structure, that's not too different than creating job descriptions. Uh, what I'd like to tease out from you is how we avoid uh, forcing the work breakdown structure to have a specific uh, job uh, breakdown. And instead, how do I, how would I describe the work that needs to be done in a way that allows me to plug people in uh, to, to the work as opposed to predetermining uh, uh, which jobs match into a particular person. I don't know the answer to that question, by the way, but it feels to me like we're looking for that flexibility. Um, Melissa is saying something interesting. She says, I have someone doing things for refugees. Uh, that's interesting. This is, uh, Melissa, do you, are, if you're online to speak, can you say a little more about what it is that you're actually doing? So, um what she has created is a program that uh, connects, basically figure out what kind of skills need, are needed. Um, well, they create a profile for the refugee in terms of, um, you know, what, what their skills are currently, as well as what their potential is. Um, and then they, their focus right now is on, on Canada and uh, Switzerland in terms of what's needed for jobs. And then they match those people based on their cultural abilities, as cultural, cultural adaptability, as well as um, the skills that they have and what their potential is with what's needed um, within those regions, within those countries. They're, we're moving it further, but I think it would be helpful for what Trisha, want, Trisha is thinking for the um, underserved. Thank you. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking a little bit about how would I want to convey to a potential uh, workforce the thing that I am trying to accomplish without having broken it down into I need the following jobs to be done. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure how I would go about doing that uh, because it's been so common to break this into specific jobs. And, and I'm looking for a different way of describing in sufficient detail the work that needs to be done uh, without necessarily forcing a particular parsing. I don't quite know how to do that. Um, but. I I think it has a lot to do with future planning. So it's identifying the future plans of where the country is necessarily going. Say, for instance, in Jamaica, mm -hmm. we're moving much into being a logistics hub for the region. And so then our skills will move more towards um, data analysis and, and that kind of thing. And so that's how we'll be able to tell. So, in, so coming up soon, we will probably need a lot more of these people and we need to make sure that there are people like that who are trained here. Um, so it. I think... That's, that would be um, one way of um, addressing that problem. I'm sure there are other ways. <laughs> so, well, I can, I can imagine someone trying to show leadership by saying, we want the country to move in this particular direction for the kind of work that we believe we should be doing to improve our GDP. And, you know, as much as some of us are worried about some of the things happening in China, it's fair to say that they are being fairly expressive from the leadership point of view to say, well, if artificial intelligence is important to us, 
you know, uh, climate change is important to us. Uh, alternative energy sources are important to us. This sort of broad uh, indication of what skill sets may be important uh, from the national perspective. I, I'm going to answer the Mars question. Uh, the protocol that we use for the interplanetary internet is called the bundle protocol. So that's the unit that we transmit is the bundle, uh, in case you're looking for uh, a term. And if you look up uh, either bundle protocol on the net or delay and disruption tolerant networking, you'll get quite a bit of information about uh, that. And it includes the uh, security mechanisms that are part of the bundle protocol. Uh, the graph database idea um, sounds absolutely fascinating, but I don't know what it is, so I'm hoping that uh, David might be able to say something. Um, but, but before you jump in, given we have only six minutes left, let's have a quick look at some of the other comments here. Um, so Tricia and Melissa, you have already started a conversation. We will leave you to figuring that out. Uh, Robert says that uh, they have some examples in the UK with ex-military going into Tesco, which is a shopping uh, uh, store. Uh, into con oh, that's interesting. Uh, into construction. So they start with the old WDS, look for transferable skills. Oh, how fascinating. Yes, I see. Ah, so what Robert is, is describing from my point of view is a very interesting educational process. Uh, whereby the, the employer is learning about what these other skills mean. Now at Google, we've gone through exactly this process and we now understand what it means when somebody says, I was a special, you know, a third level specialist in mobile foo. There's a whole set of nomenclatures for skill sets in the military. We've ingested those semantically and now we know how to map that into job descriptions that are coming from employers. Uh, so that's helpful. Um, wow, let's see. People are typing faster than I can read. Um, I don't know what a JTBD framework is. Job training something? Uh, this is from Aaron Lehman. I think that's jobs to be done. Uh, thank theory. you very much. Okay, uh, step forward. Oh, I see. That's interesting. This is kind of like almost like a little auction thing. How curious. Um, well, I will take that away as a really interesting possibility, even if you didn't quite mean auction. Uh, the idea that people could bid on work uh, uh, would let you on the receiving side of this figure out what's not yet covered. That's fascinating. Um, I like the other comment here, employers have to learn as, as well as employees. Yes, 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 absolutely true. Uh, collective work return to the commons. This is from Lucien uh, Tarnowski. Uh, society has a tendency of thinking about jobs around individual. Oh, that's interesting, as opposed to pods, teams, and networks. Uh, yes. Okay, yes, I think, I think Lucien and I are thinking along the same lines that they have this aggregate collection of people and capacities that make up uh, a, uh, um, an, an initiative. Uh, let's see, so he says, enabling communities to become economic engines by being a gateway for talent and capital. That's an interesting mix to bring in the capital question, corporations, foundations, and government. Um, you know, in terms of communities, this is showing up in Puerto Rico right now. We're starting to see communities in Puerto Rico asking, how do we jumpstart our own economy? What things can we do for each other in our community that, uh, that we will find valuable uh, and therefore um, be able to create uh, a working economy? Uh, I think that uh, your Lucian's ideas here are very much worth pursuing. Community-based um, development, I think, is a very, very attractive bottom-up uh, thing, and it could be very attractive for governments to uh, reinforce. So we're three minutes away from finishing. Uh, so actually, I suppose I should turn this back over to Ben uh, to do whatever wrap-up is normal for these sessions. <laughs> normal as of today. So um, 
Sounds good. So just to make sure people can uh, can leave at the half hour um, beep, I wanted to say a big thank you to Vint. Thank you very much. These are uh, mostly unstructured settings, and so whatever works for you works for works for me, works for us with reading versus going back and forth with the um, the dialogue. Um, and I also want to thank everybody who participated. There were some great, really uh, engaging questions. Um, I will be following up via email with everybody so that you'll have a recording of this session and you'll also have, um, I'll, I'll document all of the comments so that we, ha we haven't lost anything. And uh, just say here's the next couple people who are coming up. So Monday we have Monique Morrow. Um, uh, Monique is the co-founder of the Humanized Internet. How could, and this is relevant to some of the stuff we've been talking about today, how could the blockchain um, reactivate refugee health professionals? And also Thursday, September 13th, Sven Otto Litorin on um, successful elements of a humane policy on restructuring. So that's next Monday and next Thursday. So thanks again, Vint, and thanks everybody. That's a wrap. Okay, thanks so much, Ben. Thanks everyone else. I really appreciate the thoughtful comments and look forward to the next, uh, next session. Thank you. See you on the net. See you on Monday. See you on Monday. <laughs> See you on Monday. <laughs>